Thank, thank you very much and good morning everyone. Now it's often said that to plan for the future, we must understand the past. And what I want to do this morning is just tell you a story of asthma research over the last 50 years in New Zealand. One particular theme to show you that research does matter. It can lead to marked reductions in mortality and improvements in management. And that it's really important that we understand where we've come from in terms of knowing why we are where we are now and what we need to progress further. So I'd like to start my story by showing you this slide, which is, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which shows asthma mortality rates in a number of countries, including New Zealand, since the 1960s. And we have this terrible burden of mortality in the 1960s, along with some other countries, such as Australia and the United Kingdom, but not Germany or the United States or Canada. And then we had a second epidemic in the 1970s and 80s, which was even greater and lasted for longer. Now with funding from the Asthma Foundation and the Health Research Council of New Zealand, we were able to identify from a series of epidemiological studies and experimental studies that one particular beta agonist, phenoterol, which was a high dose preparation, poorly selective and potent, was the cause of the mortality epidemic it was the cause of why we had one and other countries did not. Helen Clark, who was the health minister at the time, she withdrew for not all, and the mortality fell within 12 months, and then we remained amongst the rest of the pack. Boehringer Ingelheim, which was the manufacturer of phenoterol as an ethical pharmaceutical company, then withdrew the high-dose preparation worldwide, and mortality fell in other countries as well. So here we have a very simple example relevant to asthma research in New Zealand, where focused research led to the saving of thousands of lives in New Zealand and hundreds of thousands of lives internationally. It's worth doing. I think the slide also shows that management needs to be informed by research and the research must translate into clinical management to have an impact. Okay, now, amongst the many surveys that were done at the time of the epidemic, there was the task force survey which looked at the circumstances in which people were dying. And also, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this slide showing that delay in seeking medical help, the lack of appreciation both by the doctor and the patient of the severity of the attack, the underuse of preventive treatment in terms of inhaled corticosteroids or oral steroids during the severe attack, the over-reliance on beta agonists, and the discontinuity of care, these were features that were common to most patients who died from asthma. And these were exactly the same features that were identified during the 1960s epidemic with isoprenal and forte, and exactly the same features that have been shown in surveys over the last 30 to 40 years. So how could this information inform us in terms of how to manage asthma better? Well, clearly we needed a system that patients could use that could avoid delay, that could lead to recognition of severity, to guide long-term management and the management of a severe attack, and integrate assessment and management in this way. And so this led to the Guided Asthma Self-Management Plan System of Care, which evolved directly from the knowledge gained from the mortality surveys in New Zealand, that led to the asthma self-managed plan system where patients for the first time were given the ability to assess their long-term and acute severity, guide them in terms of the importance of their baseline preventive treatment, and what to do and when to do it in the setting of a severe attack of asthma. And so this is the Asthma Foundation Asthma Self-Management Plan from the 1990s, which essentially led the world in terms of this form of treatment, which has now been adopted internationally. And with the support of the Asthma Foundation, we undertook a series of studies in the Maori community in the Wairarapa, showing that not only was this system of care very effective in reducing morbidity 
and improving health outcomes, but I think also importantly could overcome the barriers that were facing the Maori asthma community within our health system. This was followed by a number of studies around the world that looked at the asthma self-management plan system of care based on the New Zealand model. And when you put these all together in what's called a meta-analysis, you can identify that whatever treatment you're on, if it's within the framework of a self-management plan, it can lead to 40 to 50% reductions in these important things. Hospital admissions, ED visits, unscheduled doctor's visits, days off work, and nocturnal asthma. And in other studies, particularly from Australia, I've identified that it may also reduce the risk of mortality. Now, I'd say to you that if we had an asthma drug that could do this, Pharmac would actually pay for it, a real price, and everyone would be on it. Okay? And I think one of the challenges we have is to ensure that all asthmatics in New Zealand have an asthma self-management plan of one sort or another that can guide them in terms of their long-term and acute treatment. Because those reductions in major health outcomes are marked and they're impressive and they are obtainable with actually very little effort initially, but does require long-term supervision. Now, there are a number of questions about the exact way in which we should implement the plans, and I think it's important we understand these because this is really the skill, I think, in implementing it with different patients because we're going to modify the plan according to the preferences and needs of the patient. And so we need to accept that different patients will have different requirements and we need to just tinker with it with them in negotiation. Some patients will require peak flow guidance, particularly those with brittle asthma or poor appreciation of the severity of their asthma. Other patients can do just fine with a symptom-based plan. The real issue is really what are the components of the plan that lead to the efficacy? And I think there's now fairly firm data that the instruction to double the dose of inhaled steroids when you start to get worse may in fact be the key. Not necessarily that it's having a pharmacological effect, but more in terms of the change of behavior that as a patient not notices they're getting worse and the plan instructs them to double the dose of the inhaled corticosteroids, which they haven't been taking for a period of time, it reinforces the importance and enhances compliance in terms of the delivery of this aspect of their care. And we need to vary the amount of detail and negotiate with the patients how they might use it. But the last thing here is really the modern issue with management plans is that they were designed before the era of ICS and long-acting beta agonist therapy. And there was uncertainty as to how they might be adapted in terms of what has now become the standard of asthma management. And this, of course, led to the SMART regime, which in some respects can be considered close to the ultimate asthma self-management plan, because this uses a single fast-acting ICS LABA combination therapy, both as maintenance and as reliever therapy. And so one, the patient will automatically titrate the increasing dose of the inhaled corticosteroid according to their severity, and there's a guarantee that that will happen. So when I look at the SMART plan, I think of it as, in its essence, the ultimate asthma self-management plan system of care. And remember, it must always be delivered in clinical practice in association with a written plan that the patient can refer to. So I want to show you the main study on which the SMART plan uh, was proven to have benefit. And this was a study published in The Lancet almost 10 years ago now. And what they did is they put everyone, very briefly, on the same maintenance treatment of Simbacort, one puff in the morning and one puff in the evening. And then as the reliever, they either took a short-acting beta agonist, a long-acting beta agonist, or Simbacort, the combination ICS lab therapy. Now, I do need to mention a feature of the trial, which was that there was an ICS dose reduction on entry, which is not something we would do in clinical practice when we want to step up treatment to get better control. We wouldn't step down the ICS dose, and I'm going to tell you in a minute why that's important. They also excluded patients who were overusing the beta agonist, the very patients we'd want to get that greater benefit from. But they had a very solid primary outcome variable, which was severe exacerbations. Okay, so this is the 
primary outcome of the study, which is the rate of severe exacerbations over the 12-month period of the study. And what they showed was that if you had Simbacort maintenance therapy, all patients were on that, if you moved from a short-acting, sorry, if you moved from a short-acting to a long-acting beta agonist as your reliever, you could reduce the risk of an exacerbation. And if you then change from a long-acting to an ICS labor reliever therapy, you can reduce the risk of an exacerbation further. So this was a paradigm shift in our understanding of ICS therapy. Uh, it really challenged dogma. And it showed that increasing the dose of an inhaled corticosteroid in the setting of worsening asthma could lead to a clinically and statistically significant reduction in severe exacerbations. So how did the respiratory community deal with these findings? Well, there was a problem. They clearly recognized, based on this and other studies, that PRN, combination therapy, in addition to regular maintenance therapy, was effective in reducing exacerbations. And it's likely to be effective in those who are having exacerbations. But there were contraindications to its use, which were the very patients in whom we'd want to use them because the clinical trials hadn't examined the SMART regime in the patients who we'd want to use it in. So we had this mixed message in New Zealand that led to a deadlock. We knew that the SMART regime reduced severe exacerbations, but there was no evidence of benefit in the high reliever users, the ones who we'd want to use it most of all, or in those who had problem asthma. So when there's uncertainty, there's polarized opinion. And so there was gridlock in New Zealand in terms of how we should embrace, or not, the SMART regime. And so if we look at the, um, what became a fairly sort of um, high-profile debate in terms of the SMART regime, the concerns were that it excluded patients who, were, who would need this therapy most. There was limited generalizability because they were quite strict in terms of what patients they would allow into the study. And we know, for example, smokers have reduced efficacy with inhaled corticosteroids. Would that make a difference? There was a step down in treatment, which is something we wouldn't do in clinical practice, where we wanted to step up. And we had difficulty assessing risk, because we didn't actually know how much patients were taking. And we knew from the mortality epidemics, one of the problems is when you get a potent high-dose beta agonist and you overuse it and there is delay in seeking medical help, there may paradoxically be a risk of mortality. Okay. So this was a problem that led, was not just relevant to New Zealand, but led to uncertainty internationally. So we approached the uh, Health Research Council who funded the first independent study of the SMART regime. And I want to particularly acknowledge um, Peter Black, who was our senior colleague who died before we had the opportunity to undertake the study, but was crucial in terms of its planning. And I know many of you will have known Peter, um, who was based in Auckland. So what did we do? We wanted to ask the questions that had been raised from the SMART research program up until that time. So we wanted to know, did it lead to overuse? And did the overuse lead to delay? Which we knew were the crucial factors that would increase the risk of mortality. Would it improve, on a positive side, would it improve compliance with inhaled corticosteroid therapy? Would we get a bit much systemic steroids on board if they were using it all their time as their reliever? and how effective it was in an all-comers population rather than a tightly restricted population. So we did a 24-week open-label parallel group, randomized controlled trial in four primary healthcare practices um, and one hospital uh, in New Zealand. And the design was very simple. We got 303 patients and we randomized them to Simbacort as maintenance therapy and either Simbacort as the reliever, or salbutamol as the reliever therapy. So we call that the SMART regime, or the standard regime. And we followed them over 24 weeks. We did one thing that had never been done before in terms of an asthma clinical trial. What we did is we put a little chip in everyone's inhalers. And so every time they used them, we could record it. So we knew exactly what they were taking. Now, this was a great idea, but I tell you what, it was quite difficult to handle the data because we ended up with over 250,000 times of actuations. 
uh, we actually had to dispense over 2,500 monitors, and we recorded almost 50,000 days of treatment. But actually it worked, because we got 98% of all the inhalers were returned, and we got accurate data from 95% of all those that were dispensed. So we actually, for the first time, we get a handle on actual use. Now, because our primary outcome, our primary concern was risk, our primary outcome variable was a bit complicated, but it was identifying how many times did each patient use either more than 16 puffs of their subutamol or more than eight actuations of their Simbacort in addition to their full maintenance. And there's a two to one bioequivalence in terms of subutamol and formotol, and that's why it's 16 versus eight. And these were the limits of agreement that were also um, the limits on the management plans that patients were told they should seek medical help in that situation of worsening asthma. So this is our, the findings of our primary outcome variable, and this is the SMART regime, and this is the standard regime. And the proportion of patients who had at least one overuse episode was about 50% in both groups. We did a sort of a sensitivity analysis because some of the people in um, the standard group worked out that the Simbacort didn't work too badly for a rescue as well, so they would take extra doses as well. And so when we accommodated that into our model, that put that up a little bit. So it's roughly similar between the two. But the thing that was really interesting, when you looked at the total number of days in which there was overuse, the standard regime it was twice as often as with the SMART regime. So if you use the SMART regime, where the only difference was the use of a Simbacort inhaler as relief, compared to a subutamol, you could halve the number of times in which there was an overuse episode. The other thing was, what about delay in seeking medical help? So we looked at the proportion of overuse episodes in which there was delay, no one got medical help within the next 48 hours. And that's this little dark purple bit here. So in fact, most of the episodes of overuse, the patients did nothing. About 10% would seek medical help within 48 hours, in both groups, but because the total number of overuse episodes was less with SMART, there was a smaller absolute number. So we had really good quality data here that the SMART regime did not lead to more overuse episodes, it led to less. And that if you had an overuse episode, you were not more likely to have delay in seeking medical help, which were the two really key features associated with bad outcomes and asthma. Very quickly, just some of the other findings we had, that the total and how steroid dose was obviously greater in the SMART regime. But because they had fewer attacks of asthma, they had less steroid use. Okay? So when you add them up and work out... Whoops. I'm always drinks with this. Here we go. So when you add them up, the inhaled steroid dose systemically and the oral steroid dose systemically, in fact, they had the same steroid load in terms of effects on adrenal function. Okay, so that was a relief. That didn't lead to more, an unacceptably high steroid burden. The other issue, as I mentioned at the beginning, was we were quite interested in compliance. If a patient forgot or deliberately or non-intentionally didn't take their preventer medicine for the day, but then had to use their reliever, if that reliever had a steroid in it, were there fewer days in which there was no steroid use? Well, that was shown to be the case as well. So over a, over a six-month period, there were 10 fewer days in which there was no steroid, uh, absence of steroid use in the SMART regime. And then the really important issue of what about severe exacerbation rate, that that was 40 to 50% lower in the SMART regime compared to the standard regime. Okay? I haven't got some slides of this, but I also want to point out that we looked in a sensitivity analysis in a Maori community and in the smokers in the study, because two, they're two very high risk groups in terms of the New Zealand community. And these benefits were paralleled in the Maori group, showing that they had at least the same benefit with the SMART regime as non-Maori participants. And also we had a very similar rate of reductions in the smokers compared to the non-smokers, showing that they may be another group that may preferentially benefit from the SMART regime because they have a higher um, burden of disease. So if we put that into what's called a captain Meyer curve, which sort of sees how they get on over time, we can see a clear separation in terms of 
the proportion who are exacerbation free with the SMART regime and then with the standard group over the six month period of the study. So we concluded from our study, um, which was the first independent study of the SMART regime, the first study to utilize these electronic monitors, that it has, no matter how you cut the data, that it has a favorable risk benefit ratio. And it can be recommended for use in patients with asthma, particularly those who are at risk of severe exacerbations, particularly Marium Pacific and also smokers who have a greater burden of disease. So I want to illustrate this as an example of how targeted clinical research that can translate into clinical practice can resolve uncertainty and can guide management. And so in fact, in some respects, where we are today goes back 50 years in terms of identifying the risk factors for why people would die from asthma. Addressing the self-management plan system of care to address those risk factors into a guided self-management approach where the patient takes control and then how that needs to be tested and tested and tested again as new treatments become available in terms of how you might deliver that system of care. And I can tell you that the Asthma Foundation have funded, apart from that last study, many aspects of that journey of asthma research over the last 50 years in New Zealand. So what are the asthma research priorities? Well, this slide's slightly misleading because we still have work to do on morbidity and mortality. You'd never say it's done. There's more work that needs to be done. But I think the high priority in terms of asthma now is prevalence. And this is a slide taken from Innes Ash's study of the Isaac study in New Zealand, which the Asthma Foundation has supported over a long period of time, which shows the prevalence of clinical asthma. And we can see ranked, the colors are ranked by whether it's more than 10%, 5 to 10, or less than 5%. And there's no data in the, these countries. And we see that New Zealand ranks one of the highest in the world in terms of asthma prevalence. And I think in some respects, the burden of disease is now being driven by our high prevalence. And that has to become the focus in terms of our research effort from here. And I think we can keep studying prevalence and risk factors as long as we like, but we have to now cut to the chase and we have to do primary intervention studies to determine whether we can get simple, practical public health or pharmacological measures that we can implement on a widespread community study. And I'd propose that that is the priority in terms of asthma research from here. So I'd now like to turn to the respiratory strategy that the Asthma Foundation released last night. And what I like about it is that it takes a very holistic approach and a very broad approach, not just the pure medical model that I deal with in terms of my research, but the really important recognition that it's the implementation of these initiatives that are the key to reducing the disparities in health care and health outcomes that are a real burden in terms of respiratory health in New Zealand. So in addition for strategies to prevent respiratory conditions, and we broaden this beyond asthma to COPD, lung cancer, and childhood bronchiectasis, all really high priorities, it's also focusing on researching implementation, models of care, service evaluation of existing initiatives, which are the ones we should be putting our money into and which ones don't have efficacy, and the importance, as Tristram said last night, in terms of improving health literacy. Likewise, recognizing in the breadth of respiratory disease the importance of obstructive sleep apnea, the real increasing burden from COPD as a priority, but also the implementation in terms of the importance of health psychology and respiratory disease as well. The annual respiratory check, check is really important because this is modeled on the three plus plan in Australia, which was shown to be effective in terms of regular review of high risk patients within your practice. And we can't fall asleep at the wheel in terms of not picking up things if they're improving or going wrong. And the real importance that with any, within any health research program is to measure the indicators to look at what's happening and identify what the changing priorities might be. So I'd like to thank you all for your support and involvement of the Asthma Foundation and your support for the research programs which the Asthma Foundation funds. Thank you. Time for a few questions, yeah. Any, any questions for Richard? Yes, one there. <laughs> Quite 
tight. Yeah. Thank you, Pro Professor Beasley. Um, it was excellent. Um, Self-management action plans, as you've demonstrated, are very effective and important, but in my own practice I find them very hard to um, be set up and um, unfortunately in nursing currently we um, are not allowed to transcribe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a vision of seeing them electronically yeah. sitting between secondary and primary, but have you any other ideas how we yeah. can easily get these implemented? Yeah, and that's a really important point, and that's the, this, this issue of implementation. Uh, so, in fact, I can let you know that the Asthma Foundation is just about to finalise their asthma guidelines for New Zealand, which are up to date. Um, they're not in the format of a very extensive document. It's not a textbook. It's actually called a Quick Reference Guide. And one of the features of the Quick Reference Guide is they have drop-down boxes where you can download, for example, a management plan, um, you can download a risk assessment, um, you can download an assessment sheet to use in a severe attack of asthma. Uh, and in terms of the management plans, there are three plans that can be downloaded. One is a three-stage plan based on inhaled corticosteroids and a short-acting beta agonist. The other is a four-stage plan, and the third version is the SMART plan. And they have been based on the clinical trials in which the plans have been um, in which the evidence of efficacy have been shown, but formatted in a way which hopefully will make it straightforward in terms of their implementation. Now, you raised another issue there, was the, the concern that it has been decreed that nurses cannot um, prescribe in terms of a management plan. Um, and I think that is an issue that can be got around very simply in terms of strategies within a practice. Um, and I think that that's where some leadership is now needed from the nursing community in terms of achieving that change. Any other questions? No? In that case, I'll ask Lou to thank P Professor Beasley. Oh, we have one more question. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Richard, um, for highlighting some of the things that we need, and I specifically like your last slide. My confusion is about self-management plans. And I know you mentioned most of that for adult patients because there's a big difference between pediatric and adults. And the question is about this doubling the um, steroid dose. There, it's a lot of, we're teaching clinicians on that, especially in, in pediatrics. And we say that we should not be uh, increasing the, uh, the inhaled corticosteroids uh, or doubling that. And then some of the adult physicians are telling us there's no evidence to show that doubling the dose makes a difference. Yeah. There is a real confusion yeah. when we are teaching practitioners. Could you just uh, yeah. go through that with us, please, a bit more? Yeah, I think that's really important, Smita. The, um, first of all, I think there's a bit of a black hole in asthma research in childhood. It's clearly underdone. I know it's more difficult, but it's not that difficult. And I think that there's a serious, there's, a, there's one of the priorities which I, in terms of asthma as clinical research is children. And that's where a lot of the unacceptable morbidity actually occurs. So that's the first point. In terms of the doubling the dose of the ICS, so that my presentation today relates to adults, not to children. In terms of adults, I think the confusion relates to behavioral change versus pharmacological change. So there's there's very limited evidence that there's any pharmacological change in doubling the dose from two puffs twice a day to four puffs twice a day. But as I showed you in the SMART regime, there's a very good evidence that if you titrate the dose of ICS more frequently during the day, so you increase the frequency as well as increasing the dose, that it clearly does reduce severe exacerbations. And there's no other interpretation of that Lancet study. But if you go back to the management plan studies, it's clear when you look at some of the detail of them that it's the behavioural change. It's not that it's going from two puffs twice a day to four puffs twice a day, it's actually getting the patient back to use it because that's what the management plan is telling them to do. So I think that we, I think there is, is some consistency in that instruction when we consider the behavioural and also the evidence to the increasing the frequency of use as opposed to just increasing the dose. Uh, and so I think that that is why it's remained a component of management plans 
but also a reason why that the three-stage plan without that instruction may also be reasonable for some patients to use, which is why the foundation and their quick reference guide offers both a three- and a four-stage plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, th can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Richard, for a, a um, compelling um, presentation. I'm absolutely certain that all of us out here agree that research is the foundation that we then launch, or launch from to, and it influences our clinical practice. And, and it's interesting to me, and, I, and of course I was there and didn't put my hand up because I didn't have a question, but often as the years go by, I wonder if it's because we think research is over there and we're over here. I think others may say, no, Lou, it's because we know research informs our practice. So thank you. Um, we need to have people like you back to remind us just that, that we cannot go out there with credible academic knowledge without the research behind it. And um, the research, as far as I'm concerned, must be relevant and credible for us to be able to help our people out there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.